Good morning, everybody. This is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. It's the last uh, meeting of the fall semester. I'm Alan Sherman, a professor of computer science and director of CDL. Uh, today, um, we will present work on shadow IT in higher ed. This is a collaborative effort by uh, SFS and CYSP students at UMBC that started back in January 2020. Um, let me share the screen. We are recording now and we'll post um, the recordings on the Cybersecurity Center webpage. Can, it, <clears throat> can everybody uh, see the slide and hear me? Okay, thank you. Whoops. So this is joint work um, with uh, Selma Goez, uh, Cyrus Bonyadi, Enes Goloshevsky, myself, Dr. Peter Peterson from University of Minnesota Duluth, Dr. Forno, uh, Sydney Johns, and Jimmy Rodriguez. Uh, actually, several other students were also involved in the original research study, but the people I just mentioned were those who continued on to work on the extension of that work and the writing of a associated research paper. Um, every January, we spend a week at UMBC SFS students and DOD CYSB students analyze some focused aspect of the um, uh, security of the UMBC network. And in January 2020, uh, the focus of the study was a piece of shadow software written by the chemistry department at UMBC called SAMS, which provided some useful grant management capability that was not provided by the central UMBC administration. We analyzed this ad hoc software and found several vulnerabilities. <laughs> this motivated us to study the problem of shadow IT more generally and spearheaded by um, uh, Selma, we carried out a survey of IT professionals in higher ed. And today we're gonna share uh, our work, uh, which involves three points, the um, original case study of SAMS, the, the survey, and then there's one other piece, which is a um, what we call a profile. It's a sort of like a taxonomy, but it's, um, it's a tool that's useful to understand um, how a particular type of shadow IT fits in, and this understanding can facilitate um, uh, decisions on how to manage or, or how to establish policy. Okay, let, let's begin with um, just a review of what is shadow IT. So it's uh, application system software or hardware that is unknown or unauthorized by the uh, unit that has the authority for the particular computer network. Um, many people view shadow IT as a very negative thing. Um, for example, in 2014, a Presbyterian Hospital in Columbia University was fined $4.8 million for a data breach that was the result of um, shadow IT. Um, um, I appreciate if people could mute themselves, I hear an echo. Uh, an unauthorized server, when it was decommissioned, um, released patient data. Uh, this unauthorized service server was an example of shadow IT. This multi-million dollar fine was the largest fine uh, for HIPAA violations in U.S. history. We, however, um, take a more balanced view of shadow IT. It's not all bad. It does have risks. It's often... 
written by inexperienced authors who don't fully know what they're doing. It's often not vetted for security adequately. It's often poorly maintained or poorly backed up, but it can provide some benefits. Um, usually it arises because there's an unmet need. Like people want to do their jobs and the official software doesn't work very well. It can also provide um, an environment that can facilitate innovation and provide faster and more flexible solutions. This talk will be organized as follows. Um, I will continue making some introductory comments and then uh, Ennis will go over the case study of SAMS. Then Selma will review the uh, survey. Uh, Cyrus will explain our security profile and finally, I'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. We have a fairly long paper that we've written, um, and this paper has an extensive review of prior work. Um, there's really too much for me to mention here, but I, I will selectively say a few things. Um, we have been doing these um, SFS studies for several years, and we've published I believe three papers on those prior studies. Um, Jones in 2004 uh, wrote a paper that talked about shadow IT in academe. Um, in 2016, Copper and Westner proposed a tax, taxonomy that's somewhat similar to our profile. And there are many, many publications uh, that involve case studies, surveys, interviews, um, really too many to list here. Where our work distinguishes from this prior work is that, that we have a, a more comprehensive view of shadow IT and focused in higher ed. It's comprehensive because we're looking both in the nitty gritty through the case study, through the, uh, the broad survey, and then also with our, our new profile that adds some innovations over the work of Copper and Western. Higher ed is a special context. Um, it's a very difficult setting for computer security because it involves a large open access system. Um, many users are motivated and have knowledge to create uh, shadow IT. The university has many databases that are attractive to hackers, uh, intellectual property from research, financial information, personal data, including credit cards, as well as um, uh, medical information about students and staff. It's one of the, um, the most challenging uh, environments in which to secure computers. Our work um, makes five contributions. Um, we start off with the case study. Um, we do a survey of IT professionals in higher ed. Uh, we sent it out to thousands of people and got 53 respondents. Uh, the analysis of that survey shows correlations. We identify factors that are associated with shadow IT, which is a novel contribution. Uh, and, we, and we give a comprehensive view of shadow IT in academe. Um, expanding the views that have been presented before. And finally, um, our security profile is helpful um, to guide officials in developing policies and um, mitigation strategies. So with this, I'd like to now turn over the mic to um, uh, Selma. I think Kenneth is gonna go first with the case study. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it was my mistake. Thank you, Alan. I was actually happy to let Selma take this part and I'll handle it. Um, so we have a case study that we'd like to present to you, which essentially will introduce the audience to what we're talking about when we say shadow IT. At the UMBC chemistry department, they developed this wonderful piece of software called the Sponsored Awards Management System, which I'm gonna call SAMS from now on. And this piece of software, they developed it to help them track administrative spending on grants and awards. So the chemistry department is getting grants, you know, from, from some entity and they want to buy chemical supplies 
equipment with those grants. And what this website essentially does is it allows users to put in requests for these materials, and then it allows authorized users to approve these requests, which then go to another branch of the chemistry department where they get approved again, and then supplies show up at your doorstep. And I don't mean like pens and stuff, right? This can be controlled chemicals and, and, and things that can be dangerous even. And they developed this in about 2010. We studied it in 2020 with the SFS cohort at UMBC. The system went through a few revisions before we got to it. In 2014, DOIT sort of took it over and they they actually updated it to a, what I would call a real database. It was using Microsoft Access before that, which is a real database, but it's very light. And they also introduced a PHP web front end to make it fancy. So that was roughly when DOIT became aware of it. But for four years prior to that, it was sort of doing its own thing. Um, and certainly it existed outside of the scope of, of DOIT's knowledge. So this is quintessential shadow IT. Could I get the next slide, please? So we, we, when I say we, I mean DOIT had several interesting questions for us about this piece of software that we certainly agree with. And, and this is, these are questions that you really want to probably ask about every piece of software you're running on your network, especially software that sort of emerges out of nowhere or from the shadow, if you will. Uh, to begin with, how vulnerable is this application on authorized access? That's sort of the big concern. You have this application that's designed for distributing grant money, essentially. And an unauthorized user could potentially cause some issues there, especially because money is involved and controlled substances are involved. So there's high motivation for an adversary to do something. How well does SAMS protect the privacy of its grant data? This is important. Um, certainly, if I'm working a grant, I don't necessarily want all the grant spending to be public knowledge, although it ends up being so anyway. Uh, but, you know, public, it's sort of public in a true sense if anybody can access the application with or without author authorization or look at the grant data, certainly. What possible vulnerabilities does SAMS introduce as a stepping stone? So how can an adversary pivot from this application to other applications on the UMBC network? Sometimes we're tempted to think that a single application's vulnerability is that application's problem, but it's quite usual that the weakest link gets used by an adversary to attack other points in a network. So the SAMS could certainly present such a weak link. And uh, fourth question, does inspecting SAMS, so by, through our study of the application, can we discover any evidence of previous malfeasance that we did not detect, or that DOIT did not detect? So ha has somebody attacked this application actually already? So we're looking at these sort of four questions when we study this for the week in January 2020. And we certainly found some interesting things. I want to talk about the system architecture of SAMS a little bit. So SAMS is basically your typical web server database pair. So if you look sort of on the right of this illustration, you see that there's a sandbox web machine sort of in the middle. And it's speaking with a database machine on the right. And there's also UMBC's web auth instance that's controlling access to these things. And what we're talking about when we say a traditional web server is you have an Apache server running, you have PHP running on that Apache server. There's a Microsoft SQL server running from 2012. Um, and these three components are working together essentially to provide this, this service to the users. We had an additional point of access when DOIT set up the sandbox for us. So you'll notice at the top left, there's, a, there's the word sandbox. So what this is, is they set up a sandbox for us to analyze a copy of this application. And when I say analyze, I mean everything goes. So this was a sort of white box, black box, gray box analysis. Different teams took different approaches, but we clobbered this thing for an entire week. And we did so through Cyberbox, which is essentially a, it represents any host, much like a host would exist on the UMBC network. And we used basically this host's perspective to, to attack the system. And this is essentially mirrors mirroring what you would be doing in a, in a sort of real life situation if you were to attack the live SAM system. And I'm not saying you should go do this. I don't know if it's still running even, but certainly at some point it was, and it was very likely reachable by people that shouldn't have been able to reach it. Uh, next slide, please. Our sort of... Um, attack path, if you will, 
required us to VPN into this Cyberbox machine, which is standing in for a user on the UMBC network. And then from there, we would communicate with the other systems. In some cases, in most cases, directly with the web server, but also in some cases, directly with the database server, which I believe is not possible in the live system, but it was possible for our test. But it doesn't, doesn't matter that much, as we'll come to find out. So if we go to the next slide, we can start talking about some of the stuff we found. So let's start by answering these questions. So how vulnerable is the SAMS application to unauthorized access? The conclusion from our study is extremely. So like, like many pieces of shadow IT, SAMS contains a host of vulnerabilities. And it's not just shadow IT, actually. Uh, most web applications often contain many issues that lead to them being vulnerable to unauthorized access. And we'll talk exactly about what those issues tend to be. Um, and certainly SAMS does not protect the privacy of its grant data as a result of not preventing unauthorized access. And it's quite likely, um, we looked at a few scenarios that, that an adversary that can penetrate SAMS, which sort of as, as mentioned before, is not very difficult, can pivot to other aspects of the UMBC network, probably by using credentials they harvest from SAMS. We certainly did not find any evidence of prior malicious activity, but there's some issues with the SAMS application that, that can also account for that, which I'll discuss sort of later. But for now, let's take a look at some of the actual problems we found, and I'll sort of relate these to Shadow IT, each of them, because they're extremely common problems for web applications, especially web applications written sort of by individuals or by amateurs or even by professionals. Uh, that, that can linger for many years. And it's worth noting that these problems lingered even after DOIT took over SAMS in 2014. So they're not always obvious, but we'll go over some of them. So the number one, the number one, if you're writing a web application, anybody here ever for any reason, even if it's for shadow IT, which it might be, which more, more than likely will be, SQL injection. So when you receive user input, you need to not trust the user input. And this is sort of what SQL injection is all about. So one of the major issues with the SAMS application is you have these fields all over the place, you know, when you're inputting the materials you want or the comment. We're going to talk about the comment box. There's a comment box with every request where you can leave a comment for the authorized user. And the issue with this comment box is it, if, if I can direct your attention down to the bottom of the slide, I have a SQL query there, which pretty much looks exactly like like a query would in the application, but I've color coded it to show you the, the sort of purple um, text there. And, uh, and I hope people can see that so where, where it says, you know, update purchase request, set comments equal, and then th that's equal to the, whatever text is in the comment box. So you can put a whole query in there inside of parentheses as we did here and, and begin making arbitrary queries to the database. And the issue is that when you can do this, there is no expectation of authorization of privacy anymore. The entire database becomes yours for the taking, uh, which was which was the case during our study. So we can arbitrarily modify any table in the database. We can enumerate the database. We can query all the users, all the grants, everything. So anybody on the UMBC network at the time that this application existed that had basic user access, which wasn't everyone, by the way, it was people who were in the chemistry department, could do this. So whether you are authorized to approve grants or not, you could view every grant, you could view every user, you could modify grants at will. And that's sort of an issue. And it's a common issue for web applications. Next slide, please. There's some other issues as well. So when you're setting up an Apache web server, there's various best practices you should follow. One of them is not allowing arbitrary users to crawl through your entire uh, directory listing. Uh, normally, we are provided the source code by DOIT when we work with them on these on these research studies. But but in 2020, we did not need it, because it turns out that you can just get the source code from the application by asking politely. This is the I want to talk a little bit about why, why a best practice involves not doing this. It's not that necessarily giving somebody your source code should make you vulnerable in the sense that we don't believe in security by obscurity. But 
I also believe strongly in making things as hard as possible for the adversary. And if you're just handing them, you know, everything on your web server, I don't think I don't think this is the way to go. And it's woefully common in in sort of amateur web applications and and shadow IT web applications tend to have these problems as well. But we've also discovered that many professional web applications can have these problems for what it's worth. Uh, next slide, please. We have cross site scripting. So unfortunately, because of that comments field, which you now see in the screenshot here is not sanitized, you can do other things that aren't SQL injections, you can do cross site scripting That is to say you could insert scripts into the comment. And when an authorized user looks at the grant, the script will automatically execute because it's on the page, right, it's being served to them by the web by the web browser and the web server. So cross site scripting, you can use all kinds of fun things, probably our favorite thing to try and do with it as proof of concept is to do phishing attacks. You could certainly try to steal cookies, although browsers have made this significantly more difficult in the last 10 years or so, mainly because this is one of the huge vulnerabilities on the internet. Um, you can certainly try to eavesdrop on sensitive information. And then there's these fun click jacking attacks where you actually get the user to, to click things that they don't want to. Um, Cross-site scripting, one of the most common vulnerabilities in web applications. SAMS has it all over the place, by the way. I'm singling out this comments field because it's nice and easy for us to use, but I'm, I want to emphasize that many, many, many fields in this web application are vulnerable to both SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Next slide, please. So we had, a, we had various other fun things we found. So if you're writing code, it might be tempting to put little debug sections in there and various other things. But this is the only time in my entire life where I've seen a debug mode for a server get enabled by a user. So the idea is if, if you if the user communicates with the server and says, hey, I'd like this server to run in debug mode, the server does that. And um, that comment in the source code for this little snippet I want to discuss the snippet briefly. So it's checking basically for the user's variable, if they have the debug variable on. And um, then it changes some of the logic to, to bypass the normal authentication. And I want to point out that comment, we did not add that. That was in the source code when we, when we looked at it. So certainly, if you have a note that says remove before production release, well, when is your production release for Shadow IT? That's an interesting question, right? So the problem is if you're following this sort of software release cycle where you're saying, okay, this is this is a work in progress and we're going to release it. When do you release a piece of shadow IT software? Because I could tell you SAMS existed from 2010 to today, presumably, and it never had an official release. You know, there's no, there's no versions really. And certainly there's no production release because it was never really intended for a production release and you had little snippets of code like this with comments that say hey you know remove this but it's not clear where in the software development cycle some uh, something like this sits in shadow it and that's maybe an interesting thing to observe as well next slide please there's all kinds of front end issues so if you're going to let users input passwords you should probably uh rate limit that for those of you who, who enjoy sort of brute force attacks or dictionary attacks, it's always nice if you can input passwords as fast as possible, because then you don't need the database, but you can also get the database as we've discussed. There's a lack of directory permission control. So, I mean, being able to access, you know, all the directories on the web server without any sort of authorization, including web, web auth authorization is a problem. And certainly you have cross-site scripting on the front end causing issues, which we discussed on a previous slide. So lots of problems there as well. And I want you to remember all these problems because we're going to talk about this in a moment here. Next slide, please. So let's answer the question of how vulnerable this, this application is. So the Open Web Application Security Project, which we affectionately refer to as OWASP, listed top 10 vulnerabilities. They've been harping on this stuff for, I would say, at least 20 years now, probably longer. And, and they've sort of indicated what they believe the top 10 vulnerabilities, broadly speaking, for web applications are. And, um, well, it turns out that about eight out of 10 of these, SAMS fails. And, and many shadow IT, saw, uh, we, we've looked at sort of other web applications, sorry, not shadow IT, but web applications in general tend to fail these. So OWASP is completely correct in its assessment. And we can pretty much go down the list. Injection attacks, yeah, we have those, right? We have SQL injection. We have, you know, cross-site scripting. So that it certainly is an issue for SAMS. 
we do have broken authentication. I mean, in some cases, you know, you can bypass authentication completely. You can certainly access the database to access all kinds of things that you don't have authorization to access. And you can troll directories, et cetera, et cetera. Sensitive data protection, well, we're not protecting anything, right? All the grants are sitting in a database and the, and the adversary can extract them at will, pretty much unopposed. XML, ex in external entities, we didn't really look at this. I didn't see much XML in use in the application when we analyzed it. I don't think anybody looked at that. So we didn't find that for what it's worth, but also we didn't look very hard. Broken access control goes without saying, right? If you're not controlling access to your resources, then it's, it's unfair to even call it broken. I mean, it's more like non-existent access control. Security misconfigurations, we certainly have those. The Apache server is allowing you know, arbitrary users to travel through the database, oh, sorry, not through the database, but through the directories to look at source code and all kinds of other fun stuff. Cross-site scripting, absolutely, right? We have this comment field where you can throw in arbitrary scripts. Insecure deserialization, didn't, didn't spot any problems with this. Although, I mean, doesn't mean doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we didn't we didn't spot it, right? Certainly, we're using components with known vulnerabilities. At the time we studied the application, it was 2020. They're using Microsoft SQL Server 2012. I don't I don't know why it has to be so old, but that's characteristic, by the way, of Shadow IT software is that it since it lives outside of the purview of uh, IT departments that are sort of doing mandated patching. Often the components in a system like this don't get patched as, as often as they should. We see this all the time. And certainly going back to the issue of has this application been attacked by an adversary successfully? Well, it's tough to know because the logging and monitoring facilities in SAMs are not stellar. You know, it's not logging every important thing that it needs to log. And on top of that, the log file resides in a directory accessible by arbitrary users. So you can actually just look at it. And if you need to make modifications to it, well, you can probably find ways to do that as well. But yeah, so this is sort of an overview of what, what a typical shadow IT web application might look like. And absolutely, this case study confirms that these things can be enormous security risks to have on your network. And here we have an example of a higher ed piece of software that was, you know, that they that they develop with good intentions that existed for 10 years that has all these problems in fact it basically almost fails every single top 10 for the old wasp sort of specification which i think is um, both discouraging but also encouraging because it means that old wasp knows what they're talking about at any rate uh that's the end of the case study so we can advance it to the next slide and i believe now we turn it over to selma so thank you so m motivated by this case study, we carried about a survey and we're going to learn, carried out a survey. And now we're going to learn about that. Thank you. Um, so when I talk about the survey, we're going to go through three uh, key areas. Um, there's going to be an overview of the survey. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some susceptibility factors and then provide a general landscape of shadow IT and higher ed. Next slide, please. So when we did the case study and it was completed and you saw all these vulnerabilities in SAMS, we thought it can't be that this is unique, um, that this kind of application is natural to be developed in higher ed and it must exist you know, in many schools. And then that prompted the broader question of you know, shadow IT. Um, shadow IT itself, what was the landscape of it in higher education? And in order to provide, in a sense, context to the case study that we just completed and to try to address some of these questions, um, we decided to develop a, a survey. Next slide, please. So um, I want to start by recognizing the Department of IT and particularly Jack Seuss, uh, Damian Doyle, and Tom Penniston for their contributions and actually helping us um, put together the survey, deploy it. And um, we did go ahead and conduct the survey in October of, of 2020. And it was placed by email invitation on two servers um, that were targeted, list servers essentially that were targeted to IT professionals and higher education. The survey itself is about 42 questions and we'll go through the kind of questions that, um, that we asked, uh, but mostly they were multiple choice or ranking type questions. 
and the results were collected anonymously uh, using a, a UMBC version of uh, Qualtrics. Now, in terms of who actually of uh, the 53 uh, complete survey responses, even though we had others attempt the survey, there are only 53 uh, truly complete survey responses. Uh, the individuals completing the surveys, the majority, and I would say 80% or more, uh, were male um, over the age of 45 with over 20 years of um, IT experience and over five years of cybersecurity experience um, with some sort of a graduate degree and also individuals whose jobs involve um, policy and strategy. So that's the picture of the people who um, answered the survey. In terms of the picture of the institutions that they represented, um, along three dimensions, we looked at the demographics, essentially the kind type of institution, um, was it doctorate granting, was it community college, um, the size and size being measured by, um, by essentially the, the number of students, and then also the structure of the IT department. And with regard to, um, to the type, we saw the majority were in fact doctorate granting. Um, the size, there were two kind of um, big peaks in terms of the size of um, the institutions, one between two and 10,000 students and the other 26,000 plus. And in terms of the, the structure of the IT department, um, they were mostly either partially centralized or centralized. Uh, next slide, please. So the, one of the key findings from the survey was essentially that Half of the respondents identified that in the last three years, they'd experienced um, a security incident related to um, shadow IT. And even more striking was that half of those individuals indicated, that, in fact, that the majority of the security incidents that they'd experienced in the last three years were, in fact, uh, related to shadow IT. And this this finding provided an opportunity, essentially a lens to kind of look back at some of the survey um, responses to try to see if there were certain factors about the institution itself or about the shadow IT or other things that we could look at through the survey questions that actually showed a correlation um, with the incidence of a shadow IT related security incident. And we did that through um, five basic categories that we'll go through institutional demographics, um, what kind of graduate schools were present at the, um, at the schools, uh, the types of shadow IT involved at the campuses, um, the kinds of security violations that were typically seen there, and how flexible was the institution's approach to shadow IT itself. And then separate from looking and investigating those essential susceptibility factors, we just look more generally, again, at the landscape of shadow IT in higher ed, trying to get a better sense of a picture of what, what did it actually look like? Who was using it? Um, what was the impact to the organization? Why were people introducing it to the organization? Who was responsible for fixing issues related to it? And for those who had successfully managed it, what were some of the strategies um, that they found useful? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you could go back one. All right, it's okay. A quick, just a very quick note on methodology in terms of trying to identify those factors that had exhibited a correlation to a security incident related to shadow IT. Um, essentially, looked at uh, tests of independence with a significance level at 0 0.05, um, and then used R Studio to develop the contingency tables and develop the statistics. Next slide, please. So the first susceptibility factor that we looked at was related to institutional demographics. And we talked earlier about the ones that we actually looked at in the survey were the size of the school, um, the structure of the IT department, and the type of institution. And of those three, the only one that showed um, a correlation at the significance level was the type of, um, of the, the structure of the department of IT. So essentially for those departments that were more decentralized, the probability of the likelihood of a security incident related to shadow IT was higher. Uh, 
So this is obviously correlation is not causation and not to say that in terms of an intervention, you would, you know, change the structure of the IT department to deal with the issue, but rather that the correlation identifies something in a sense, an institution that sees the benefit of having um, a decentralized IT department. Um, potentially, this is something to kind of be aware of that, that potentially there are underlying uh, factors that will essentially produce or introduce this as an issue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, while the survey was being developed, uh, someone had an interesting point, and that was a discussion of how common uh, shadow IT was at a particular graduate school within the university. And so we decided to see if this particular observation was borne out in general, if other schools essentially had that same sort of focus in certain graduate schools in terms of uh, shadow IT issues. And so we asked each of the respondents to identify first which graduate schools were present, you know, College of Arts and Sciences, a business school, education school, engineering, medical school, law school, et cetera. And then later they were asked to identify of those schools for each of those to identify any in which they felt that the usage of shadow IT was high. So the um, two graphs here on the slide, the one on the left, is basically a frequency graph in terms of the number of respondents that first identified that school present, and then the shaded portion, the darker part, identifies that proportion of respondents who identified it as a high usage school. And so on the left, you see the College of Arts and Sciences and the Business School and the Education School at the top. But when you recast the graph in terms of really proportion, in terms of of the, the users within those schools, that the proportion that were identified to be high usage, um, the ordering changes, and you see that the engineering school and the medical school um, atop the list. Now, as an interesting um, kind of complement to that finding, when we looked at correlations between presence or not of a particular graduate school, and the existence of a security incident related to um, shadow IT, only three schools um, showed the correlation at the significance level. And the three were uh, medical school, uh, engineering school, and the architecture school. Um, so again, correlation is not causation. And one could certainly argue that um, something other than it being a high usage school uh, would contribute to um, higher potentially security incidents related to those schools. For example, the data that's available at a medical school or at an engineering school might be more attractive to hackers. Regardless of the underlying reason, the correlation that you see though highlights essentially, you know, areas of focus for an organization, a school with limited IT resources trying to deal with an issue of shadow IT provides an opportunity potentially of where do you focus um, your efforts? Where would be a fruitful place uh, to tar target? Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the things that I was very curious about in starting the survey was, you know, what exactly constituted shadow IT in higher ed? You know, what kinds of things were seen there, you know, as opposed potentially to the private sector or, or public sector? And um, so one of the questions the respondents at were asked were, in the last three years, identify any of the types of shadow IT that um, were present on your campus. And if you look at the graph on the left, it's again, a frequency uh, graph in terms of any respondents who identified it as occurring on their campus. And the top three, we have cloud storage, uh, unauthorized software, and legacy systems. And again, the darkened portion reflects later on when the respondents were asked, given that this type of um, shadow IT exists at your institution, you know, which is it of high concern to you or not? Um, and then the graph on the right takes that information, recasts it as a proportional in terms of the proportion that actually of the respondents who identified that type of shadow IT identified it as high concern. And you can see that, um, again, at the top, you still have cloud storage, um, 
then followed by unauthorized hardware, and then a third, again, uh, legacy systems. So cloud storage um, certainly uh, topped the list and I think reflects kind of the, um, the wave of the future with regard to shadow IT and shadow IT issues. But if you look at in terms of um, the correlation to existing security incidents related to shadow IT at the institutions, the only three types of shadow IT that showed a correlation of significance were internal custom built, legacy system, and unmanaged devices. And I think this finding was in, in a way essentially uh, very gratifying with respect to our case study um, because two of the three, the internal custom built and legacy system could be used essentially um, to characterize our, the SAMS case study. Uh, next slide, please. So a related question that we asked um, with regard to shadow I type of shadow IT was um, those who had experienced a security incident related to shadow IT in the last three years were specifically asked to then name one, the single dominant form of shadow IT involved in that security incident. And again, interestingly and reinforcing of our case study at the top of the list um, was legacy systems. And so, again, if you're thinking about limited resources available to an IT department um, and dealing with issues related to shadow IT, um, knowing in a sense um, the areas of particular focus um, is helpful in targeting the, the limited resources. Uh, next slide, please. So with respect to security violations, um, the respondents were also asked, in a sense, what uh, percentage of their security violations would they actually say are related to shadow IT in some form? And you can see from the graph here that the majority um, kind of a label was identified by uh, the most number of, of respondents. And if you combine either majority or equal parts, um, you can see that, that that is essentially the majority of all the respondents. And so this um, proportion of security violations was also another of the factors that showed a correlation at the significance level. And so this is a very common sense result, you would think, you know, the, ma the majority of your security violations are related to shadow IT, then chances are you're probably going to get uh, more shadow IT related security incidents. At the same time, you could think of this proportional kind of figure as a metric, kind of a, a quick gauge of where you stand as an organization and um, an easy way to kind of look at something and say, you know, this is where we are. We've got a very high proportion of security violations related to shadow IT. You know, what are the consequences of that? Uh, next slide, please. So the, the last susceptibility factor that we looked at was the organization's approach to shadow IT. As Dr. Sherman mentioned at the beginning, shadow IT is something that can be looked at as having some very uh, positive benefits as you know, private sector is seeing that as well. And so if a school and organization wants to take a more flexible approach to shadow IT, you know, what are the consequences of that? And you see here um, the graph on the left the respondents were asked to, on a scale, rate the current approach of the organization to shadow IT, with zero indicating the most flexible, kind of no restraints at all, um, and 10 indicating the, the most constraint you can imagine in terms of a lockdown with regard to shadow IT. So respondents were first asked to rate it as they see it currently, and you see the results cluster in the center, center right. Um, the graph on the right, the respondents were then asked, what is their desired approach uh, for shadow IT? And you can see it changes to very much be clustered to the right um, in terms of a more kind of controlled approach to shadow IT. Now, these were IT professionals who are often called in with the you break it, I fix it um, uh, issue or mentality. And so the idea of wanting to control or exert higher control uh, makes sense, whereas someone strategically looking at the university might potentially um, you know, take a, a different view of that. But nonetheless, when that set of figures were divided essentially in terms of more control versus less control, again, a correlation at the significance level was found 
with regard to incidents related to, um, to shadow IT. So uh, given that and the potential strategic desire potentially to have a more flexible approach to shadow IT, how do you create the infrastructure? How do you create the guardrails to allow that greater flexibility, but do it in a way where security uh, is also balanced against that? Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next set of, of slides uh, will be really just looking at the broader questions that the survey also tried to address to understand who's actually using shadow IT, what's the impact and things of that nature to really try to kind of fill out that picture of shadow IT in higher ed. So the first one was um, the respondents were asked to identify all those that they felt were um, like high users of shadow IT first by role. And that's the graph on the left where you see that faculty, uh, no research faculty research uh, dominated um, and administrative staff came in next in terms of who's really using it. Who do they see as being those top users? And then when the respondents were asked in terms of the departments to identify all departments that they felt, you know, uh, had high usage of shadow IT, again, you see at the top of the list academics. Um, and so, again, when you think about an organization with limited resources to address something, um, this kind of gives you a sense of if you're instituting some sort of training program or other effort, you know, where does it make sense maybe to start first? And, you know, is it faculty and the academics department as, um, as these graphs might indicate? Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to also get an understanding of what was the impact of shadow IT on organizations. So one question we asked was um, the relative cost of, of security violations related to shadow IT versus not. Um, the top bar on the graph on the left says that essentially uh, those respondents identified those violations related to shadow IT as having a greater cost than other um, violations. And, and a significant chunk also reflected um, equal to in cost. So while this might indicate that it seems like there is an impact in terms of the, um, the cost, it costs us more to deal with issues related to shadow IT, we also did ask the respondents if the majority of their budget was related to shadow IT issues, and they overwhelmingly said no. And we also asked if the majority of their time was related to dealing with shadow IT issues, and they also overwhelmingly said no. So there is a cost, there is an impact, but it has not become a problem to the level that it dominates. Um, we also asked the respondents to rank order the negative impact of shadow IT and consistently uh, respondents identified data compromise. And again, um, while they consistently see this as an issue, there have not really been um, you know, penalties other than the major one that Dr. Sherman mentioned at the beginning we haven't seen this widespread, um, essentially, penalties for data compromise in higher ed. And as that changes, potentially, um, the, uh, the cost um, and the focus and the amount of energy related to shadow IT may change as well. Uh, next slide, please. So not surprising, why do people use it? They use it, um, most of them selected the slow shadow IT as the um, so IT department as the uh, number one response. And one of the respondents um, kind of basically said, no matter what you do, strategies, et cetera, policies, enforcement related to shadow IT, um, if you don't address the root cause, you're never gonna really solve the problem. And that respondent was really reflecting the idea that unmet IT needs are really what is driving the use of shadow IT. Um, and you have to counterbalance that against IT departments that have limited budgets and have uh, wide ranging responsibilities. And so how do you then create a structure um, to be able to allow, for example, users to more likely meet their own IT needs, but again, within the constraints and some um, kind of guardrails essentially that help also to balance with um, increase or or fundamental levels of security. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, who's responsible for the fixes? And we asked the respondents to identify anyone they felt 
at their institution was responsible for dealing with any issues that would come up related to shadow IT. And um, in terms of that uh, set of responses, the ones that had the highest responses were the individuals who introduced it. Um, and then if you combine decentralized IT and centralized IT, then IT itself becomes the, the largest response. Now, asking those same respondents who should be responsible, um, it was interesting to see that their response was managers. And so these IT professionals, again, who are the ones dealing with you break it, I fix it, um, looking to potentially what can you do in terms of um, pushing more responsibility to managers to essentially um, um, deal with the issue. Uh, next slide, please. So ending on a successful or positive, hopeful note for the future in terms of um, shadow IT, we ask respondents to identify in their personal experience, any of these different types of approaches that might be successful uh, and they had success with in terms of dealing with shadow IT. And the responses were, you know, ranged from, you know, educate and train to things related to policy and enforcement of policy to things related to more kind of structural uh, sort of solutions, multi-factor authentication, centralized sign-on, et cetera. And it was interesting to see um, that at the end, looking at all the responses, the number one um, was educate and train. And, you know, the idea of educate and train kind of goes back to the fundamental issue that you need to address security through the people who use the technology. And, and so this result is very consistent with that kind of bright, broader idea. Uh, now, that completes in terms of the different sorts of things we looked at at the survey. And I just wanted to close by saying that one of um, the things that we found that having only received 53 responses was certainly a disappointment and a limitation of the survey. But I think regardless of that number, it was interesting to see how the findings um, were very consistent with what we would intuitively think that we would have found. Um, and not only that, but kind of internally consistent with each other and with our case study. And I think even for that level of the responses that we received, that we did provide some data that essentially started to create kind of a view, a window onto this whole idea of shadow IT in higher ed, you know, where it is, what it looks like, what kind of a, an issue it is, what kind of an impact it's having. And so, um, despite that limitation, I think that at least we provide some interesting um, kind of insights and guides that could potentially, you know, help an IT department with limited resources think about where to focus um, their efforts with regard to shadow IT. Thank you, Selma. Um, Drawing upon our experiences from the case study and the survey, uh, Cyrus will now explain the profile that we developed, which uh, helps us to characterize uh, the, the nature of shadow IT, especially from a point of view of vulnerability assessment. Hi, can everyone hear me all right? Just a sound check. Some thumbs up, some something. Cool, perfect. Um, so, in the interest of brevity of time, I will keep this uh, brief into two parts, uh, elements and application. So, next slide, please. So, uh, as Dr. Sherman said, um, we, alongside our work, uh, pre previous, okay, cool. uh, alongside our work on the case study and in the survey, uh, we did a lot of thinking as to how to capture this issue at a larger scale. To that end, we developed a security profile, um, placing a good emphasis uh, as we did so on the development of a profile rather than a taxonomy, though recognizing as much as we could the current state of the art of taxonomies uh, with the hope that potentially we could we could eventually with enough scale bring our profile to that to that realm. Um, the most prominent taxonomy in this uh, field is done by copper and uh, a lot of the work that we did in developing our profile actually aligned with it, uh, though we didn't know that at the time. Um, some key distinctions between um, what we consider profile and what we consider taxonomy um, is the idea of characterizing versus categorizing or classifying, uh, where you can uh, 
get to an asset driven or um, ideological physical aspect to a taxonomy uh, as a profile we're talking much more ontological at the functional level what how do these things function with each other what function do they serve uh, that helps you characterize a lot more of the vulnerability aspects, uh, what things are actual vulnerable to the system, rather than the risk assessment, um, what happens if this thing breaks. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So in doing so, we, we broke this into four parts, um, all of which are choose one except for modality, though, of course, um, as it is more functional, that's more of a suggestion than it is a requirement, right? Um, these things are, are, as we'll see later, a way to view the ways in which vulnerabilities may arise. Um, this, the four categories that we've uh, recognized are source, or is it externally produced, internally developed, or was it internally developed um, as a formal part of IT in the formal review process and no longer is there? Um, of course, it could have been externally produced and adopted in that way. Uh, the idea here is that we're characterizing shadow IT uh, by an industry definition and expanding that industry definition to be anything that is outside of the review cycle of an IT department. Um, so while you might think you may think some things, of course, would be IT driven, um, if if it's outside of the review cycle and IT knows about it, then it could be sanctioned by IT and an abandoned solution. Right? It's not currently in the review cycle. It could be outdated, and at that point, it is shadow IT. It's something that's operating without the authority of the IT department. Of course, authority sanctioned, unsanctioned. Uh, modality is oftentimes just discussing the way in which this thing operates. So operational, is it operational procedure? Is it something you or I do to accomplish a goal? Um, or is it any of these other more physical aspects? And then motivation was something that we really focused on. Um, the idea of uh, fix, customization, duplication, these kinds of ideas of how did this arise, right? Um, the difference between duplication and replacement may be that uh, for replacement, something broke and you need to replace it outright. You can't just fix it. For duplication, it may be, oh man, wouldn't it be great if we just had a group password for this account as well? Uh, probably not, probably terrible. Uh, so next slide, please. The aspects that are different from our profile to the copper taxonomy especially are the ones that are highlighted here. Um, some considerations that the copper uh, taxonomy has that we don't and something that we would love to include in future works is an idea of scale. Um, once you get the idea of scale involved, you can get the idea of a surface uh, attack surface involved. And with an attack surface, you can begin to recognize risk. Um, if these vulnerabilities are exploited, who can be hurt? How much can they be hurt? What type of data can be hurt? Um, these types of uh, improvements are things we'd love to improve in, include going forward, but they, they require a lot more uh, uh, resources, a lot more people responding to surveys, uh, and a, a lot more uh, data and work than we were able to do at the scale that we were operating. Um, not to overload that word too much. So how does this get used? Uh, next slide. So the two most prominent ways, actually we can just skip to the next slide as well, that we've used this have been, uh, of course, in SAMS, the one where we developed this with, and IMS, where we actually, in the process of developing, use this profile to understand the way in which a system may fail and found a really interesting and cool vulnerability this year. Uh, so the characteristics of SAMS and IMS, they're very similar. Um, SAMS, by contrast, is legacy, and IMS, by contrast, is a replacement um, in its motivation. Uh, you get the same idea of um, unmitigated vulnerabilities or incomplete code review, but legacy implies unpatched vulnerabilities of things that have gone on and have updated over time, whereas replacement suggests the idea that some of your uh, interface interactions may be arbitrary. I apologize if you can hear background. My Alexa feels the need to talk to me. Um, next slide. So uh, here's just following up a little bit on that idea um, on how things have broke over the years and when we've uh, investigated them and tried to understand them uh, and attack them in our case studies uh, and the ways in which we ended up finally breaking the system. Uh, I think one thing interesting to note uh, is that uh, both instances of SQL injection had the combination of software and legacy. And, then, and that's something you, you, of course, will deal with a lot when you have a legacy system that's software driven and it's not just a piece of infrastructure or something along those lines, it's, especially if you have a database, as NS said, uh, you're going to find yourself <laughs> with a lot of vulnerabilities related to that database. Uh, most recently, though, uh, and I think important to highlight at, at risk of going over time, uh, was uh, having a replacement system that used uh, quite a few different modalities allowed us to understand that, that 
these systems are arbitrarily communicating with one another. Um, IMS is a ticketing system that is basically a wrapper around an existing ticketing system, um, though more in operational procedure than anything else. And uh, as a result, we were able to exploit the fact that it was doing two operations in two different mediums at once and have a race, uh, race condition on an upload. Uh, so we could upload a large file and end up executing it before it finished uh, operating with that file, which was very exciting. Uh, I, I don't believe we would have found that had we not, or had at least some of us not been looking at this study in that way. So uh, next slide, and I think that should be my last one. Yep. Back to you, Dr. Sherman. Thank you, Cyrus. Um, so in conclusion, um, in our case study of SAMS, uh, we found that it was a, a typical uh, shadow IT that was useful, uh, but its ad hoc uh, creation introduced a lot of vulnerabilities, including cross-site cross -site scripting and SQL injection. Um, we surveyed IT professionals in academe, and we found that uh, shadow IT uh, was often associated with decentralized IT uh, in presence of medical engineering or architecture schools and many other um, relationships that uh, Selma described. Um, Cyrus uh, presented our profile and illustrated with some examples of how it can help guide vulnerability um, analysis and it can also be useful for uh, officials in guiding their policies. Um, and this profile looked primarily at source, authority, modality, and motivation. Um, we have provided a comprehensive view of shadow IT through uh, a case study and survey and profile. And we believe that this will be helpful to administrators in uh, shaping their policies um, and balancing of the risks and benefits of shadow IT. Interestingly, a lot of the themes that arose in shadow IT are really more general and transcend um, uh, cybersecurity. And, and specifically, I mean that when there's a need for people to do something and there's no authorized solution that enables them to do that conveniently with appropriate functionality, then you will see the rise of shadow solutions. Um, therefore, it, to the extent to which you want to um, regulate shadow IT or encourage it in a safe way, I think you must very much look at the central driving cause of unsatisfied um, uh, needs. We'd like to thank our, our sponsors. This work has been supported in part by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense. At this time, um, Please feel free to ask any questions to any of the speakers. Uh, hello. Can you Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, when looking into all these like vulnerabilities in sort of shadow IT progress, like I, I, uh, I agree with the sort of conclusion that um, shadow IT is almost inevitable when you know, it takes a long time to, you know, authorize software or you need a very specific need. So how do you sort of um, educate, you know, the people making all these shadow IT solutions, you know, administrations and stuff, um, and sort of like making sure that it's, you know, people understand the importance and vulnerabilities when, when, you know, there's all these vulnerabilities it could take a long time to really understand, you know, so how do you sort of meet that compromise of allowing shadow IT while making sure it's okay. Uh, Cyrus, do you wanna um, respond to that? Yeah, I was actually about to raise my hand. Um, yeah, it, it, it really comes down to your uh, security posture management strategy to borrow a phrase from, from industry at this point, which is quite buzzwordy which is to say that um, you have to be aware of, of what amounts and zones of trust you have in any given circumstance. And segmented networks, as we talked about, as was being talked about in the chat, is a great example of a way to do that. Um, that said, uh, 
it's it's behooven upon from what our survey says and and what I think a lot of people would agree it, 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 management and and policy to be able to prevent and and handle shadow IT no matter how much you incorporate into your review cycle you're going to end up having some set of things that IT just can't do and people are going to find their own way even if the way they do it um, is a great example that I always have is um, sometimes a crypto card depending on where you work doesn't boot up into your computer properly and so the way you have to do it is you have to get your computer to recognize that it doesn't boot up log in via account which you're not supposed to be able to do and then log in with that account and then turn it off turn it back on and then you can use your crypto card right that doesn't seem like it's shadow IT but it definitely is it's it's a, it's a procedure that isn't authorized and not part of the standard review process nowhere does it say try these strategies it's just what everyone knows to do that said, it's not about shoring up the shadow IT systems, nor the systems you don't have any control over, um, but it's about shoring up the systems you do have control over and ensuring that you know which systems are present in which zones. I think that's one of the best strategies you can have going forward. And of course, when, when something does become large enough that some other department is requesting a copy of it, i.e. with SAMs, uh, it's important to go ahead and put it under a standard review cycle and bring it into the fold. I don't think you're gonna be able to have a functional department for much longer in this world if you just continue to reject everything that isn't under your control. Uh, thank you. That makes sense. Um, I noticed there's some questions in the chat. Um, uh, this is Tina. I did have a question. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. This is, uh, this is really uh, interesting. Uh, and um, so the question I had, and I put it in the chat, one of them was just like whether or not uh, having a, an IT procurement process um, was, was helpful. We, you know, do some work with uh, setting up security programs for academic institutions of higher education. So um, just curious about whether and how you know, having a process uh, in place for how IT gets procured and doing a security impact and things like that uh, was a part of any part of the discussion. I did want to um, address that point a bit. One of the questions that we asked respondents in the survey that I didn't um, mention in, in what I went through in the slides was how did they, what was the most useful way for them to identify shadow IT within their institution? And so you think, oh, you know, kind of doing audits or reviews, uh, but the number one way by far that was identified was the procurement process. So whether okay. there was a centralized procurement process for IT, just procurement in general, kind of going to those records. Um, okay. It's like the number one way that they could identify, okay, we have this, we didn't know this existed. Okay. Let's follow up on that. So I'm glad that okay. you raised that question because it actually was, I thought an interesting finding from the, um, from the survey and people that I talked to in general too, that um, procurement purchasing, that is the key place to try to find shadow IT. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I have a second one, but I want to, I don't want to hog the time. So I'll pause there and see if anyone else has a question first. <laughs> Nobody's jumping in. So <laughs> I guess the, the other part I was just curious to know about, I know Educause, um, in reading some of their publications, they go into, um, you know, like different risk and security management frameworks. Uh, that uh, get set up at academic institutions. So they refer to like the cybersecurity framework as like, you know, a structure for a security program and maybe borrowing some risk management processes from the risk management framework, RMF, uh, both NIST. Was there any exploration or correlation um, with regard to, I guess, uh, framework or risk management process used um, at these institutions that um, factored into the, the the extent of the shadow IT problem? Um, the survey itself did not address that. And certainly okay. like we had some open-ended questions where individuals could either talk about things that they did at their institution or kind of other general comments. I didn't see anything related to that. Um, okay. but I know, I don't know if Cyrus wants to talk about it at all, at all in terms of we were thinking about how the profile kind of matches up with some of those frameworks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, to, to some degree, and I, I guess, um, 
it, it maybe to our advantage or disadvantage, uh, really scoped kind of away from that to, uh, to a bit, uh, because the work done to consider those frameworks, especially to go from the systems analysis to the systems assessment perspective, right? Where you're, you're not just understanding what vulnerabilities may exist, but you're understanding the impact they have and the way they operate requires just so many more case studies than even the six that we've done over the year, or five, six, five that we've done over the years, um, or just a couple of universities that we we're in constant communication with. I mean, something like that requires a, a ontological decomposition, followed by a systems assessment, followed by application of framework, understanding of uh, much less the amount of Likert scale data that we'd have to start accumulating and the judgment calls we'd have to make to do that. And it, it becomes a scoping problem at that point. Though right. in our thinking process, absolutely. We definitely considered a lot of those uh, systems. And one of the biggest problems we found was the fact that a lot of those, cons those systems take under consideration some sort of review process or understanding or um, uh, ability to control the, the traffic even that goes to and from one of these devices, especially when you talk about NIST. NIST assumes some, some posture at all. Um, and shadow IT, especially the way we've looked at it, necessarily is outside of the review cycle. <laughs> it doesn't have that posture over it. And so uh, it would be it would be an addendum to those types of documents, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be something that we, we should look at should we continue doing this research going forward, but would probably require a much larger scale. Thank you. Again, uh, when I saw this on LinkedIn uh, posted, I was like, ooh, that's interesting. So certainly, uh, got my attention and uh, think, thanks for doing this and publishing it. I noticed that Jack Seuss posted a comment, which I'll read. Um, uh, I think the independence of faculty, especially research based on their grants gives central IT less authority. So maybe he's speaking to one important aspect of the academe environment that um, faculty act very independently and and this certainly needs to be considered in shaping a policy about shadow IT. Are there any more questions? Um, I, I have a question. So we saw a lot of correlations, but uh, Selma, can you, you speak to um, the extent to which our findings are specific to uh, shadow IT or, or or might a lot of these associations also be associated with other types of um, software? It could certainly um, be the case in terms of our, our survey when we gen generated it, we weren't even looking to, to do these correlations. It was a sense, it was a byproduct of the survey itself and having seen so many people identify security um, incidents specifically related to shadow IT that kind of provided that opportunity to do that. In hindsight, knowing that that was going to be the case, we could certainly have, have structured things in a way to try to tease out um, how much is strictly, you know, shadow IT versus more of a, of a general finding. Okay, are there any more questions from anybody? Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will resume CD, CDL meetings in the spring semester. Um, stay tuned. I hope everybody has a nice holiday. Dr. Bye. Sherman, did you want um, any yeah, I think, Cyrus and I to stay on afterward? Um, please, um, team members, want, why don't we stay on for a discussion? Okay. Everybody else can okay. go.